Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Addiction. Guys, we got another really good show for you today. And today we are going to discuss understanding emotions, identifying current patterns, and creating new healthy habits. And our guest today, Kenzie Ray, is going to help us with that. Now, for those of you that don't know Kenzie Ray, she is a current Miss Utah International title holder. And she has this Happier Days mission, which is to uh, focus on bringing awareness to the prevalent problems of self-harm and helping people learn how to navigate their emotions in a healthy way. Now, a lot of our listeners who are in long-term recovery and those that are even starting their journey in recovery, you guys can probably understand that. And I, I just saw Kenzie on our good friend's Nick and Ryan's show, Waking Up with Giants. And when she was explaining a lot of stuff, I'm like, I have got to have this beautiful young lady on the show to talk about it. Because again, you don't even have to be battling with addiction because this is everyday life. This, this is stuff that we can learn to help our life be happier, just like she says in there, happier days. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Kenzie Ray. Kenzie, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. And also a huge thank you again. I'm going to put it out here on the podcast. Thank you for coming to our Healing Utah Success Summit. I, I was speaking with with uh, Pat and Scott, and I believe your mom, I think she was saying that, uh, yeah, she didn't feel like she did much. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, she did more than yeah, if she feels that way, please tell her no. She did so much because, as you know, I was running around with my head cut off that morning and you just jumped in and said, Al, what can I do? So thank you so much for coming out and supporting us and and just helping with the whole thing. Thank you. Oh, of course. I was happy to help. It was a phenomenal event. I love what you're doing in the community. It's so needed. And so I know how stressful events are. And so I'd love <laughs> to be on the supporting side and not be on the putting it on side and be able to be that supporting role. So happy to help. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. So you've got a little bit of a story to share. Now, you've had some stuff happen in your past that Kind of, you know, like the rest of us, I, I really do believe that the majority of us have this thing where a lot of times we don't look at ourselves as, I don't know, we don't look at ourselves in a positive way a lot of times. And I really do believe the majority of us run into that issue. And what had you come up with the happier days and also why the understanding emotions and identifying current patterns? I mean, apparently, this is stuff you had to learn and put yourself into, right? Yeah, absolutely. My journey with starting this Happier Days mission has been going on for 16 years. This is oh my gosh. 16 years, 16 year journey for me. It's been just recently since I entered the pageant that I gave it a cute brand and a cute little name, but this has been a, a journey for me ever since my struggle with self-harm at the age of 15. When I was 15 years old, I had a lot of that not enoughness. I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel like I belonged. I didn't have self-love for myself. I didn't feel like I deserved to live, quite honestly. There was a lot of that self-hatred. And like you were talking about, we don't know how to be nice to ourselves. We don't really know how to speak positively to ourselves. And I didn't learn any of those skills. And then you combine that with puberty and the awesome hormones that come with growing up as a teenager. Yeah. And I experienced my first wave of depression too. So it was a lot of emotions that came up and I didn't have the tools of how to process those emotions in a healthy way. That's not taught in school. My, my new ebook is, is titled The Class I Wish Was Taught in School because I was 15 years old with all these really heavy, intense emotions, thinking something's wrong with me. Why do I feel this way? Something's wrong with me. I feel sad. Everyone else looks happy. And I turn to self-harm as a way to cope. And that experience left me feeling extremely alone, isolated, embarrassed, ashamed. And I felt like I was the only one going through this. Some, I'm wrong or I, something's wrong with me. I'm damaged. I'm broken. And so I felt very isolated in this experience. And I remember every day I prayed to find a woman who had struggled like me. 
right? I did, I, at that point in my life, I really felt like my life was destined to just be this life filled with sadness. As I looked forward and I, and into my, you know, in my adulthood and my thirties, I was like, wow, you are destined to just be sad forever. What's the point of continuing? And so that's when I questioned my purpose here. I'm like, well, if you're just going to be this sad and filled with shame for so long, why, why keep going? And so I remember every day I prayed to find someone who was older and she had struggled like I did. She had scars like I did, but she had like made it to the other side. Someone who could give me that hope that life wasn't destined to just be this sad, sad thing inside of myself. <laughs> and unfortunately, I never found that woman. So instead, I became her. I decided to become this woman who could be that light to others who are struggling, who are questioning, does this get better? Is there hope to get to the other side? And so that's where my Happier Days mission comes from, is not only to just let people know they're not alone if they're going through self-harm or a hard time in life, they're doubting themselves, they're struggling with addiction. You're not alone. There's nothing wrong with you. And my Happier Days mission is not only bringing awareness to it, because awareness doesn't really do much, but the three-step process of understanding your emotions, identifying current patterns, and creating new healthy habits, that's my solution to help people overcome those hard times to get to a happier place. Matt, I, I love all that because, you know, a lot of the people that I've interviewed on the show They've hit, and I don't want to say rock bottom because I, I believe there really is not su no such thing as a rock bottom because you can still pick up the shovel and keep digging, right? right. There's, there's always something lower than the low, right? Sometimes people just have to, something has to happen in their life to put them on a new path. And for you to step up, like you said, you couldn't find that woman. So you're like, why don't I do it? Right? Because the challenges that you went through that a lot of people go through. And I've even found myself saying this, Kenzie, it's like, why don't somebody do something about it? And then I, I can't remember what it was not too long ago. And, and I said the same thing. Why doesn't somebody do something about it? And then I was at the gym one day and it seems like I always get these things pop in my head when I'm at the gym, it must be the dopamine or something. I don't know. But <laughs> all of a sudden I went, I'm somebody. Why can I not do it, right? I don't know how. However, if I just start the wheel turning, let's see what I run over, right? Absolutely. So I, I love that you're doing this and I love that you took on this mission and that you're out there helping so many other people because when when I was when my wife was in the depth of her addiction, I kept it very quiet, kept it from family, kept it from friends. It was a cancer that was just eating up inside me. It kept growing and it kept growing and it kept growing to where 2019, I was on my way home from an event and I was on my way home to get my pistol and go up in the mountains and I was going to take my life because I'm like, I cannot deal with this crap anymore. And gosh, now where the heck was I going with it? Just, just, yeah, I don't even remember now where I was going with it. I, I sometimes I lose my train of thought where, where I'm, where I'm heading with things, uh, but it will come back. But, um, oh, feeling alone, right? I was feeling like I was the only one that was dealing with this. And then I was having coffee with a friend one time and he just opened up and I just opened up and just said, hey, this is what's going on in my life. Because he could see that I wasn't being the same person. I, I was someone different. And when he said, start sharing your story, and I'm like, well, who wants to listen? He goes, Al. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people going through the same thing you're going through. However, we seem to just grasp onto it, right? And feel like we're all alone. No one understands. We we pitticize ourselves, if that is a word. I mean, it's like, oh, poor me. You know, I, I'm never going to change. It's always going to be this way. However, you jumped on the boat and said, uh-uh. I'm going to be this woman that I'm looking for. And now I'm going to be the light to help other individuals. Yeah. That, well, I think that shame, it's the shame that eats us alive. It's the shame that makes us feel like we are all alone and the fear to be vulnerable and say, Hey, I'm struggling that we don't give ourselves the opportunity to realize how similar all of us are. Right. When you really open up to your fellow humans, 
we are all more alike than we could ever begin to imagine. Right? Our, our journeys are unique. Our struggles are unique. Nobody's life path is exactly the same. But when you look at the spectrum of human emotions, and this is one of my beliefs that we are here to experience every emotion on the spectrum, good, bad, ugly, everything in between, we are, that's the human experience. That is what we came here to do. And so when we go through the trauma or the grief or the failure or the shame or all these yucky emotions, and then we keep them inside, we don't tell anyone about it, we're left to feel like we are the only one experiencing these these emotions on the yucky end of the spectrum but when we're willing to open up and confide in friends and get vulnerable we realize a lot more people are experiencing these same emotions also feeling alone and when you can open up you open up the opportunity to connect and to help each other and to create that community of support to say hey you're not alone you're going through this me too we can get through it together instead of us being isolated in these little shame pods that does nobody any good. Right. Yeah. And, and again, you just hit the, you just hit a key word, the, the shame, right. And also the judgment. Uh, you know, I believe a lot of us are afraid as I was, as what are people going to think of my wife? Right. Are they going to judge her? Are they going to judge me? And, you know, it is that fear factor of, yeah. What are people going to think? And, when you can open up, when I opened up and started telling what was happening in my life, people that I've known, I mean, no kid, Kenzie, people that I've known for eight, nine, 10 years started pulling me off to the side and going, hey, can I speak to you in private? And we'd go off to a little corner away from everyone and they'd open up and go, I don't know if you knew it, but I used to be an addict. And I'd be like, what? It's, it's like, I, as I started speaking, it, it's almost like it opened it up for others like they got the permission that it's okay, you know? And I also think it's very important, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's also important to find those that will listen, right? Because, and the reason why I say it, for seven, eight years in the depth of my wife's addiction, I was her therapist and I was a crappy therapist because I had no clue what she was going through, even though I thought I did. She even told me once, I wish you'd be my husband instead of my damn therapist. I get it now. I understand. And now I can be her husband. I can. I know when to listen to her and just listen. And I also know now when to say, you know what? I'm not the person you need to be talking to. Do you have someone else that you could share this with? Because they would probably understand it better than I can. Mm. So you understand it. So you're an easy person to reach out to and go, hey, I need some help, Kenzie. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, I think it's so important to it, it, the way that I refer to it is have your your safe spaces. And it, you might need more than one, right? Because my husband's a safe space for me. And we'll talk about certain things, but then there's friends that are safe spaces for me that we talk about other things. And so I think it's so important to create a circle of safe spaces that you know you can go open up to, you can confide in if it's a professional and you do need to go talk to a professional. There's no shame in that. Yeah. Right. I think there's so much shame wrapped around, uh, you know, talking to a professional or getting professional help. That was one of my steps in healing when I was in the depths of my depression and really coming out of that is I, I needed professional help to to get on the right track. So I think having those safe spaces and knowing where they are and uh, knowing that you, you can open up and talk to people. I think yeah. it's so important. Well, and you said something else that was key just a minute ago about feeling all these emotions. I, I'm on the same boat that you are on with all that. God has given us all these things that we have for a purpose. They're there for a reason. I really do believe that throughout the year, society has has pushed us away from that, that it's it's not right or you're not supposed to do this because you're weak. Right. Mm -hmm. When and especially with men especially with men. We did, a, we did an episode called uh, Toxic Masculinity on the show. And, you know, I was brought up in the way that you freaking, you didn't pry, man. You, you put your big boy pants on and you just go. And I believe throughout all these years, that's why more and more men 
I believe it's now from the age of 18 up to 55 that are committing suicide because it's that shame of not being able to not being able to show your emotions. And yeah. it's very important to show the emotions. And Nicholas T. Smith has said it quite a few times on some of the shows. And also when he was on a guest, him and Ryan was a guest on our show, you know, showing fear, having depression, having anxiety and other emotions, they are, they are not the curse. They are actually a blessing. However, you have to meet them head on right? Meet them head on. Don't, don't bury it because more and more dirt's just going to fall on top of you and it's going to make it harder for you to get out. Just meet them head on, understand those emotions and go through them and then go, okay, what's my next step? Because you usually come out stronger than you did when, before you went in. And it seems like that's what's happened to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think emotions are such great teachers. And that's why it's step one in my three step process is understand these emotions. It's yeah. part of the human experience. There's nothing wrong with you. It's okay to feel this. Every single person is going to experience grief, trauma, tragedy at some point in their life. It's just part of it. And so when you can just stop feeling shame or feel bad or feel wrong with it, then you have the opportunity to see, okay, I'm feeling this emotion and it sucks. I don't like feeling sad. I don't like feeling angry. I don't like this grief. I don't like the failure. And you're instead of feeling the shame around it, because I feel like when we feel shame, then we just want to push it away. Feel shame around this. Let's ignore it. Let's, let's numb it. Let's run away from it. Let's distract. Let's disassociate. But when you can just understand, okay, this is normal that I'm feeling this. Why am I feeling this? Oh, I'm feeling upset because someone said something mean to me. Okay, I'm valid in feeling upset. And I think if we can just say, I'm valid in feeling this, let me sit and feel this emotion. And now can I go find a tool and a healthy habit to process this emotion in a healthy way and not run away and not distract and not numb, whether it's addiction or self-harm or whatever our vices are, our negative emotional coping skills, can we use a positive emotional coping skill instead? And I think you can move through the emotions so much faster. Like you said, instead of dumping dirt over yourself, right. it's not real, it's not here, it's not here. No, it's here and it's okay. What tool do I need today to move through this and get to the other side? Yeah, and giving yourself that time, you will be surprised what comes up, right? If you're not reacting and you're giving yourself time to absorb it and allow it to happen, your choices are usually a lot better, even if it takes a little while. Mm -hmm. You know, my I get just as vulnerable on the shows as our guests. And, and my wife and I, we're going through counseling right now. And it was her idea. And it's a great idea because, I mean, we've been married. We just celebrated our 14th anniversary. We've been together almost 18 years. And we've gone through a lot together. I mean, a ton, right? Me losing my job because of my alcohol and cocaine use and then me working on myself, her falling into alcoholism. And I mean, our whole marriage has just been this flipping emotional roller coaster. And going to counseling, we have both grown in positive ways. We have both changed in so many different ways. And we've not learned how to communicate that with one another, right? Because mm -hmm. she's gone through her stuff with recovery and training as a certified peer support specialist. And I've been working 14 years on me. And one of the things that came up is she gets upset when I, when I do the quiet treatment, right? I can get upset and I literally shut myself off and, and I've, I've done it the majority of my life. However, a lot of that too, I added anger in with it. I've learned how to pull the two apart. Mm. Now my wife understands that if I'm doing the silent thing, she just basically knows I need that space. Mm. And then she'll ask me the next day, are you feeling better today? And I, either I'll say yes or no, I need more time. And before, oh my gosh, she would be like a, a dull needle trying to poke a balloon just constantly, mm. constantly. And it would just tick me off even more, right? Yeah. And and it's the same way with her. You know, I, I could say something to her and she could say, you know what? I don't want to talk to you right now because I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I know when to back off. 
So yeah, the okay. and the emotions are good, and it gives us that time to work out whatever it is that we're working out. And for me, a lot of times I realize it's really nothing she's doing. She's doing what she normally does. It's me. It's my irritation or it's my ego that's kicking in and causing it to be something that it's really not. Yeah. And I, I think communication and relationships is so important when it comes to our emotions. We are all very diverse, it, you know, depth, intense humans, right? We're all experiencing these intense emotions. We navigate them in different ways. And you process emotions different than your wife. Your wife processes processes emotions different than you. And the same thing goes for me and my husband. And it's been critical that we communicate, this is what I need right now. So I love that you guys have developed that communication skill in your relationship. I believe communication can solve 99% of problems. Yeah. You don't communicate, this is what I need to get through this emotion and uh, maybe it's not being my therapist right now and I need you to be my husband. That's so powerful. Sometimes I have to tell my husband that I don't need a solution. I don't want your solution. I just want you to listen to me vent and complain and have my moment <laughs> without any solutions. That's all I <laughs> Or I'll tell him, I just need, I'm just, I need space to just feel the feels. I don't, I don't need, I don't need a solution. I don't need you to do anything. I just need to feel the feels and then I'll get to the other side. And so communicating that with your partner is so critical and being able to say, Hey, I'm not okay. Hey, I'm in a bad mood and it's not you. Because I think as, um, as in relationships, it's so easy to take partners emotions personally. I'm really good at this with my husband. I'm like, Oh, it's my fault. Oh, oh yeah. Fault. It's about <laughs> me. But when you can just openly communicate, say, Hey, I'm having a bad day. It's not you. I'm in a mood and we're going to get through it. I think it just alleviates that any tension or any extra stress that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And and using the I statements, we, we started using and then we pulled away from it. Now we're working on, you know, it's like, this is how I feel when this happens because mm -hmm. it keeps both of us away from building our wall, our defensive wall, right? Instead of me going, you make me feel like this. Well, no one can make me feel a certain way. I'm the one who's choosing to feel that way, right? And I've heard a lot of that in the, like in the addiction um, community, you know, when people, as they were starting their journey, you know, people calling them losers and they're worthless and they'll never get well. And that's their point of view, right? However, we seem to grasp onto that and hold on to it so much. And it's literally, we're destroying ourselves even more by doing that. And instead of looking in the mirror and saying, you know what, I'm an amazing individual. And there's some things I can work on. And I'm going to work on changing those, just what you did. You know, you just said, hey, I'm tired of feeling this way. And to me, it goes back even to the addiction, right? It was even kind of an addiction with you, just in a different sense. And you just decided to say, I'm dropping the shovel. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think substance abuse and addiction is just another form of self-harm. My yep. self-harm has taken so many forms over the years from, you know, the, the actual razor to the skin, to substances, to picking at my face, to eating, you know, binge eating food, like whatever you're using to distract or numb or run away from those emotions, that's a form of self-harm when you're just trying to disassociate. Cause what is, what is substance abuse? You're, you're harming yourself mm -hmm. in, in trying to make yourself feel better or, or whatever it is. So, um, it's absolutely the same thing. It's just a different form for everyone of how you're navigating emotions. You're either doing it in a positive way or a negative way. Yeah. And, and again, it's your choice, right? You can choose whichever direction that you want to go. You know, um, before I go on to the next question, there's there's a, a beautiful young lady that we had on our show out of Colorado. And um, she shared something on social media once. And she has a daughter that any time a storm comes in, her, her daughter gets really scared and starts crying, especially when the thunder starts happening. And and she said to her daughter once, you know, what are you crying about? It's just a storm. It's just thunder. It's not going to hurt you. And she said her six-year-old daughter, and this lady's a coach. 
And she said her six-year-old daughter taught her a valuable lesson that day. And she says, mommy, allow me to have my sad time. And it floored her. And then she goes, the next time it happened, they were out sitting on their front porch and a storm's rolling in. You can hear the thunder in the distance. And she said, would you like to jump up on mommy's lap and have some sad time? And her daughter jumped up and curled up with her blanket and just she just let her hold her. And she goes, my daughter taught me a valuable lesson that day. You know, allow yourself to have those times as we've been talking about. So if a six-year-old can figure it out being six, we can figure it out. <laughs> Absolutely. That's powerful. I love that. Yeah. So what have you done to create new habits? Ooh, um, I've done a lot. Habits have been my focus for the last really aggressively for the last five years. Uh, Cause like I said, when I, when I struggled with self-harm, I was kind of naive in thinking, oh, my struggle with self-harm ends here, right? I went through something so traumatic, so crazy, so intense that I'm good. Like there's no way, like, it, like I, I'm not going back there. And so I didn't create new habits. I didn't say, why did this happen? How can I change it for the future? I was 15 years old, wasn't that self-aware yet. <laughs> and so that made me grossly unprepared for the next thing life had in store for me. My sister then died a few years later when I was only 19 years old. And I was not prepared to handle that grief in a healthy way. So then my self-harm turned to very dangerous substance abuse. And then it moved on into my 20s to, to different things. And so after I realized what I was doing and this pattern kept coming up of, can I run away from my emotions? Can I distract myself from my emotions? Can I numb my emotions? Like, what can I do to not experience this yucky stuff that keeps coming up? And I finally said, let's face it head on. Okay, if we're not going to use substances, we're not going to use alcohol, we're not going to use a razor, we're not like, what are we going to do to navigate these in a healthy way? And in 2018, I said, I'm going on an aggressive personal development run. And I want to see if all the successful people out there are right, right? What do all the second successful people say? Wake up early, write in your journal, meditate, exercise, eat healthy, right? It's all the cliche <laughs> stuff that I'd listened to for years, but I wasn't doing any of it. So I said, let me see if they're right. I'm just going to go put this to the test. So I went on this personal growth run to adopt all of these habits. And when I did, it was one thing at a time. It started with waking up early. I watched my life change. I watched myself get better. I watched my mood get consistently happier. I felt more in control of myself than I ever had. And that made me feel in control of the things going around me. Right. Because oftentimes, at least this is how I felt when I struggled with self-harm or struggled with substance abuse, is there was uncontrollables going around me. Intense life situations. I couldn't control that my sister died. I couldn't control how people treated me. I couldn't control so much happening in the outer world that I wanted to control something. I can control a razor. I can control what substances I take. I can control drinking. Like I can control these things. So let me take control of something. And so taking instead control of my habits and the time I woke up and if I worked out and journaling and writing my goals and reading, it gave me that same sense of control, but was moving my life in a positive direction. I love it. I mean, yeah, you, I feel like I've read that in a book somewhere because I mean, <laughs> really you, you nailed it. And, and really that's what it is, right? There's I spent, it took me till here I am, I'm going to be 60 next month. And it took me till here in my mid fifties to finally wake up and realize, because I was one of those people who was, I was doing my best to control everything that was going on. What has helped teach me again is being in the recovery community because they learn a lot and they understand life because they've lived it, right? I mean, they've lived it. We like to say here in our house, Stay on your own side of the street. You know, we're not worried about what's happening in the other lane. We just want to stay on ours. Now, if for some reason there's a fork in the road, I mean, yes, we have a choice which fork we want to take, right? Whether it's left or right. However, we've also learned there are certain things that are out of our control. So like I got some news yesterday about some stuff that we're working on and it wasn't the news that I wanted to hear. And 
I felt those emotions coming in of just going, oh, great. You know, the old thought patterns coming in, just just like always, you know, and it seems like this is how it always works out. And it took me about 10, 15 minutes. And I finally stopped myself and went, you know what? There's something better. This is why this is happening. There's something better out there. Something different is going to happen. And it's going to be a good different. So let it let it go. Just let it go. Because again, I have no control over it. It doesn't matter what I do, who I call. It's not going to change anything. So why do I want to sit and drive myself crazy on thinking that I can control something that I that I can't, right? Yeah. And I and I always think that life has a funny way of working out for the better. Like you said, I've heard a quote and it says, God's rejection is your protection that we think we want this thing and we want it so bad, but we can't see that there's something so much bigger that if we're able to see the two options up front, we're like, oh wait, no, I really, no, I don't want that actually. Yeah, give me this one. Yeah, right. <laughs> it has to be that faith and that the just understanding that, hey, I can't control this. So I'm gonna control the controllables and I know whatever's meant for me, it's gonna, it's gonna work out how it's supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Not being able to see it. And you know, this is crazy. What just popped up in my head, Kenzie. So uh, I was treating, uh, um, teaching some fitness classes at a, at a fitness place in West Jordan quite a few years ago. And during Christmas, we had this gag gift type elephant thing, you know, where we all got in a circle and we passed gifts around and, and you could open it up and it, you know, you could trade it or, or whatever you wanted to do. Well, one of the gifts somebody opened up, and it was in a box, but in the picture on the box was a urine bottle for people who are sick and can't get out of bed, right? And you're just going, oh, this is like what they give you in the hospital. So anyway, this one young lady ended up with it, and she had one less, ch one more chance to trade it. And she's like, oh, I don't want anything to do with this, right? This is what she's seeing in her head, right? I've got this urine bottle. What am I going to do with this? So she traded it with someone. Well, at the end, we're all ripping open because sometimes what's in the box is not in the box. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the person that she traded this bottle for, she opened it up. And yes, there was a urine bottle in there. However, inside the urine bottles was a $100 bill. <laughs> And she was like, no way, I want it back, I want it back. Well, guess what, it was too late. You know, you thought you saw something that really wasn't what you thought you saw, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that's powerful. Right? <laughs> Don't judge a book by its cover, it's the, well, it's yeah. the oldest rules. <laughs> yep, that's, that's it. And also with some of the stuff that you were working on, I posted this post on, on Facebook, I think it was yesterday, and I had this circle. And in this big circle, it had you as you're the person in this big circle. And then this little teeny, teeny, teeny dot down below said someone else's life. And, and basically it was saying, don't judge because you don't know anything about this person's life. Mm -hmm. And we seem to do that, right? So when people probably saw you back in when you were 15 and you were going through all these emotion and, and your substance and alcohol and whatever else you were going through, they were probably seeing a person that they didn't understand. Right. Because they were just seeing the abuse that you were, that you did to yourself, not really knowing those were just the band-aids you were doing your best to use to cover everything else up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the, I feel like it's the judgment and this is, this is something I'm wildly passionate about and a silver lining that I got from my experience with self-harm. Uh, because I've all, for many years after my struggle with self-harm, I remember I prayed every day that I would do anything to wake up with perfect legs because you don't really realize, especially at 15 years old, you don't really realize the permanence of your decision. You know, I didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't realize scars are very permanent. And a lot of people don't know this, but um, I have hundreds of scars all over my legs. And a majority of them happen in one night. Wow. And it was like one night, my life instantly changed from my thigh to my knee, it covered, right? It changes everything. And I, it shocked me. And like, oh my gosh, this is permanent. You can't take it back. And I remember I just prayed every day. 
please, I'll do anything if I can wake up with perfect legs, please like let make, make them go away, make them go away. I will literally do anything. And I finally had to come to the acceptance that this is, it's permanent. This is the consequence of your decision. And I'm so thankful for it now because I, I, if I could be granted one wish, we'll, we'll get rid of your scars. I would say, no, they're, they're part of me. I don't take them away. I don't <laughs> think got rid of them now, but it taught me such a valuable lesson to not judge people. You have no idea what somebody's going through. You have no idea what brought them to addiction. You have no idea what brought them to hurting themselves. You have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. Because as humans, we are so good at masking tremendous pain with a smile. And then you want to go be mean to somebody on social media. You want to say a nasty comment to somebody and you have no idea what's going on behind closed doors. I've had horrendous things said to me about my legs and about my experience. And it's, it's okay. I'm, I'm strong. I, I am the woman who can take it on and be strong enough to talk about this, uh, talk about this topic. But I always think, what if you're saying this to someone else who isn't that strong? You know, yeah. people tell me to end it. People tell me I should have killed myself. People tell me like crazy stuff. I'm like, you have no idea who you're saying that to on the other side. What if that's the one comment that really does get someone to go take their own life? So it's just taught me to be so kind to other people and don't judge other people because you have no idea what someone else is going through. Yeah. Uh, and and it sounds like your scars have become a strength. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'm here and that, yeah, your scars have become your strength. And, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Cause I, I've, I've been, I'm guilty of it. Right. I would drive downtown and I'd see the, the unsheltered and the addicts and the alcoholics down there. And I would make my comments to whoever was in the car. Or I would just think it to myself, you know, get your life together and give back to society and what the hell's wrong with you. And well, God places me in the recovery community. And man, did it slap me in the face. And I get emotional thinking about it because the guests that I've had on the show, to hear what they've gone through in their life, I probably would have been in the same shoes they've been in. More than likely, yes, I would be. I would want to cover up whatever I went through, like what they went through. And Again, it's not our place to judge, right? If we can just give that kindness and that love. And it's amazing just where a smile will even will even go. And and you know, the the place where I go work out, they've been kind of struggling with some things and, and it looks like they're really doing their best to up their game and because they've lost a lot of clients to another gym that's come in and and they've hired this young man. I would say probably, I don't know, maybe 17, 18 years old. And every morning when I go in, he's in the men's dressing room and he's cleaning it. And I've been going to this gym for a couple of years. This is the first time this has happened where every day I walk in there and this young man's in here cleaning. And he's always spraying down the lockers, wiping them down. He's spraying the mirrors. He's making sure the floors kept clean and everything. And, and it was last, last Thursday He's in there cleaning. I'm getting ready to leave the gym and I'm passing him. And I said, Hey, I just want to tell you, thank you. And he kind of got this shock look on his face. And I'm like, thank you for keeping this place so nice. You're doing a wonderful job, you know? And I wanted him to know that because as a kid growing up for me, it didn't matter how hard I worked and how hard I did everything I could to get the approval from my dad that I never got that I always, there was always something wrong, right? I always didn't do something right. And all this has really helped me all these experiences. Again, I've, ex I've experienced these to make, help me become the person that I am today and to appreciate others because you don't know what they've gone through. I mean, for all I know, this kid who's doing this, maybe he's the oldest sibling and he's doing everything he can to bring money in for his family. I, I don't know. How would you know? You know, yeah. so to tell someone, thank you for even some of the smallest things, it can change that person's life in an instant. Absolutely. The a compliment being kind, it, it goes so far. I feel like it's so 
underestimated. Kindness is such a core value of mine because I saw what people being unkind to me did to my soul when I wasn't in a good spot. And I never want to make someone feel that way. I never want, want my words to make someone feel like they aren't enough or they aren't seen. So it's like my number one message to get out in the world. I believe so many of our problems could be solved with kindness. Let's just be kind <laughs> to one another. You don't have to understand. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to understand my scars or understand my pain or what I went through. You also don't have to be mean. Right? You don't have to understand, but you don't have to be mean either. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm a firm believer, and again, this is just my belief, and my wife is feeling the same way that when someone is mean and ignorant, I look at them now as like, I wonder what kind of pain they're going through. Yeah. Because literally they're doing their best, and we've all done it. I, I'm just as guilty. I'm not innocent by it by all means. We we do it to help ourselves feel better, right? Mm -hmm. I mean <laughs> My dad, you know, he made fun of people. I, I like to say they're fluffy. That's that's my new term. People who are fluffy. You know, he used to make fun of them. And I I grew up doing the same thing, doing the same thing, because that's what I grew up around. Right. I thought, well, it's OK to do it, which is crazy because I was teased when I was a kid. I was I was crippled. I had the Forrest Gump brace on the platform shoe, walked around with a limp. And, you know, I was I was called crippled and all teased all kinds of names and and here I am now teasing other people you know or making fun of them and again 2009 changed my life losing my job it just changed my life in so many different ways and I think I've even shared this with my mom you know she's like how could you have done this or you know, you gave it up just to do cocaine or whatever and it's like this was the path I was supposed to be on this was supposed to happen you know, I, I don't understand it. I'm, I understand it a little bit more. It, if you go back to what Nicholas says and you you connect your dots backwards, you'll realize you're exactly where you're at today. Yeah. If you do that. So, yeah, I, I believe that. And I, I also believe that there if you're willing to look for it, there's always a silver lining in every hard situation. I have a hard time with the, I, I used to always say that there, everything happens for a reason. Then you look at some of the really just tragic stuff, like my sister dying. I don't believe there was a reason for that, right? Like there's, there's no reason for that that I can come up with, but I did find a silver lining in that. And so anytime I do go through hard situations, if it's losing your job, if it's addiction, if it's, if it's grief, whatever, the hard stuff that just sucks that your mind can't come up with a reason of why did this happen to me? Like what is going on? Can you find at least the silver lining? What's the lesson? And sometimes it takes years of healing. Yeah. I mean, long time to find those lessons and find gratitude for ugly experiences that I thought were going to be the end of me. I didn't know how I was going to survive these ugly experiences. But after you heal and you get through them, when you look back at those dots, you can find the silver linings, you can find the lessons, you can find how each little thing always leads you exactly where you're supposed to go. Yeah, I agree. So where do you see life taking you right now, Kenzie? I mean, it's, it sounds like you've got you've got a lot going on upstairs. It sounds like you got a lot of drive to make a change. And again, man, thank you. Thank you so much for for wanting to do that because a change needs to happen in our society and, and it won't happen overnight. However, as long as we're moving forward, even if we're shuffling forward, we're still going forward. So what is it that you... Where do you see yourself going here? Yeah, I have, a, I have a lot going on right now as Mrs. Utah International. I actually go to compete in that international pageant next month. So the goal is to win the Mrs. International title and be able to continue my year of service promoting this Happier Days mission and really educating people on that three-step process of understanding your emotions, identifying current patterns, and creating new healthy habits. I dive deep on that in my ebook and outline that. But ultimately, my goal with this is to just let people know that they aren't alone and hopefully change the statistic at some point that a lot of people don't know this, but one in six girls will struggle with self-harm. And I think it's wow. about one in nine men will struggle with self-harm. So this is such a prevalent problem still to this day. And as you talked earlier, when, when we share about our struggles and the things that we're going through and we're vulnerable, we almost give people permission to do the same thing and say, hey, me too. 
And since I've really started talking about my struggle with self-harm, I've been open about it, but people see my scars, the amount of people that come to me in confidence and say, hey, I've never told anyone this, but I struggled with that too. And you make them feel safe. You make them feel seen. You make them feel like they're not alone. And so that's, that's my ultimate goal is to let people know they aren't alone. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to hide your scars. This past decision does not have to define your future. And I know in the moment of struggling with self-harm or coping with the fact that now you have self-harm scars, you feel like that's going to define your life forever. That's how I felt at 15 years old. And, and until I was about 20, I didn't wear shorts for five years. I didn't go to the to the beach or go to the swimming pool. Like I hid in shame and I thought it defined me. And so I'm just on this mission to let people know they're safe. Let people know you can heal. You can find happiness. Your season of darkness does not have to define you. It's up to you what you do with your future. And so that's really my whole mission of this Happier Days project and my ebook, my podcast is just letting people know they're not alone and hopefully giving people the tools of creating those positive emotional coping skills to where they don't have to turn to self-harm to begin with. Can we teach our kids young enough to give them those positive emotional coping skills right out the gate so they don't have to go figure it out on their own? They don't have to do drugs or alcohol or self-harm, like whatever. Like, can you already have those tools right out the gate? And me being a new mom, I'm like, okay, your turn. You get to teach this little baby as he gets older. Emotions are okay. This is what we do when we experience hard emotions. And so yeah. I think as parents, we get to be the change of how we model handling our emotions and then how we teach our kids. So that's, that's where I'm going. It's a, it's a big project, but uh, <laughs> it's part of my life calling. So I, I love it. I love the direction. And, and yes, you are, you're, you're making a change. You know, you you definitely are. And, and it takes individuals like yourself and so many other people out there that are writing books and doing podcasts to say, look, enough's enough. And we're going to start using our voice and, and we're going to do what we can to to make that change. And, and just in the two years that I've been in the recovery community, I've already started seeing some change, which I knew nothing about two years ago. Right. And, and I'm already starting to see some things happen and, and shifting, and it is so cool to see it. And I am a big believer, and, and, and I believe you're in the same ballpark I'm in. This stuff needs to be taught in school. Yes, we need to have reading, writing, and, and you know stuff like that. However, there needs to be more classes on really life and emotions, because again, more and more of our youth are taking their lives because they don't know how to deal with things. And it's harder for them than it was when I grew up. Yeah. I mean, when I grew up, it just was rumors, you know, and, and it still is rumors, but however, it can be plastered all over social media, you know, or someone catches a picture of you doing something you're not supposed to be doing. And, and how many people have taken their life because of even stuff like that? Yeah, so for me, you know, social media is ruthless. It's, yeah. It's scary that it's just, I always think about that, like being 15 years old, trying to navigate social media. It's scary. And we we need to educate our kids on the realities of social media and that it's not real. And it, you don't need to compare yourself to it. Like there's so much that needs to be educated on because too many kids are comparing themselves, feeling not enough, and then, you know, hurting themselves or taking their lives because of it. And it's it's scary and it's sad. I believe we can create change. Yeah. If we if we stand up and we we help get these messages out there, I I agree. You know, and if there's anything we can do, Kenzie, on our side here, please let us know. I mean, if you've even got another message you'd like to share, we've got the platform. You have a platform. We're more than happy because it, more than happy to help one another. You know, I was I was a guest on a podcast yesterday, and and I said, you know, there's no competition in my eyes here. It's we're all working together to to create a change and it doesn't it to me it doesn't matter if your change is different than my change it's still a change in a positive way mm -hmm. and if we're all out there helping one another and rooting each other on man the only direction it could go is forward absolutely right yeah. that yeah no no competition at all and and you know 
I don't know if maybe you have had a chance to go out and even speak to schools. You know, I had the opportunity to speak at Copper Hills High School a couple months ago and and you got to kind of go around it in a different way, which which was crazy because I've reached out to some schools and and I even know the people over the West Jordan School District and they're like it's up to the principals. It has nothing to do with us. They didn't want me to come in and talk about addiction. They're like, "Uh-uh, absolutely not." why uh, it really needs to start now in like junior high, if not elementary now, <clears throat> however, there's back doors, right? So I happen to meet some people and uh, they work for the school and they're like, Oh, well, we'll just have you come in and talk to our health health class. And I'm like, Oh, and they're like, yeah, we can help <laughs> you do that. We don't have to get it approved through the principal. I'm like, Oh my gosh. You know? So yeah, I, I can always help connect you with individuals like that, you know, if, if you're interested and and we're we're here for you to do whatever we can to help support, because, again, it takes all of us. Yeah, I agree. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the support. And same goes for you. If there's anything I can do to support your community. Um, I do have a little gift for your community, if that's OK. If anyone, oh, my gosh. Yes. Would love to give any of your listeners a free copy of my ebook if they would like to dive a little bit deeper on my three step process of understanding emotions, identifying your current patterns, and creating those new healthy habits if they want help in that area. Um, they, they can just go to my website, it's kinseyray.com, and use the promo code WIN123. So kinseyray.com, right? Yep. And WIN, W I N. Yep, one, two, three, because together um, we can all win. I love it. I love it. And that's a free copy of the ebook. Okay. And what was what was the name of the book again? To make sure I get uh, it. Right? It's called Happier Days. It, there's a pop-up right on my Okay. Website. Happier Days. Okay. Yeah, I'll make sure I put that down in the comments. Um, yeah, when this posts. And the, this anyway, I'll talk to you about when the show posts after we get off the recording. Is there anything else, Kenzie, that you would that you would like to share with our listeners? Uh, I just would love that anyone listening going through a hard time to know it's temporary. Every storm will eventually run out of rain. And it's something I'm wildly passionate about educating people on that in those heavy seasons, it feels like it's the rest of your life. It feels like there's no way out. feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. And you question moving forward. You question, why am I even here if I'm just here to suffer and feel so much pain? And life is far from perfect. It has so many ups and downs and twists and turns that aren't easy. But I promise you, it is so beautiful and worth sticking around to experience the good stuff. Because we honestly wouldn't appreciate the good stuff if we didn't understand the bad stuff. And so I, I hope everyone listening knows you're here for a purpose, on purpose, and anything happening to you right now, it really is happening for you. And hopefully you got that message throughout this episode that all the hard things, I promise there's a silver lining on the other side. You might be in the thick of it right now, like, yeah, yeah, whatever, lady, you don't need to know what I'm going through. But I promise it does get better. We need you here. That is, that is an exceptional message. Yeah, thank you so much. That was awesome. Well, Kenzie, again, thank you for being our guest today. And, and please thank your husband for coming home for lunch to take care of, of the little guy. So greatly appreciate it. And again, thank you for helping us at our Healing Utah Success Summit. We're actually in the works of planning another one. We're hoping to do it the end of September, first part of October. However, we're having issues with venues right now. Yeah. But uh, if yeah. it's meant to be, we'll find it. If not, we're, we're still going to plan on, we're hoping to do at least four next year in 2024. And yeah, so, so we're excited. So again, everyone, thank you. Thank you to all our sponsors, uh, which big dog is one of our sponsors. They, yeah, they came in as one of our sponsors. So thank you guys. Uh, all our guests, all our guest co-hosts, which we haven't had m too many lately because we don't have a studio yet, but to, again, thank you guys. Thank you to all our listeners, resilience talk network, we couldn't do this without all your guys' support. And you guys are the ones that's making this a success. With, with you being vulnerable and sharing your stories, using your voice to make a change, man, I tip my hat off to every single one of you. So guys, thank you. And we're going to end it with this. As we do at the end of every show, remember addiction is giving up everything for one thing and recovery is giving up one thing for everything. We're out.